Again, hello. My name is Shira Gans. I am the Senior Executive Director of Policy and Programs here at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you not familiar with our office, we are the agency in New York City government that supports the creative industries. These industries represent over half a million jobs and more than $150 billion in economic activity. So this is very important to the city. One way we do this, in addition to us permitting all of on-location filming in New York City, is we've created NYC Film Green as a way to try to promote sustainable film production. Part of that is we create resources like tonight's events, as well as many others that we will soon be rolling out on our website to support productions in the city who want to take steps to reduce their environmental impact. Uh, we will put in the chat the website and you can keep an eye on it as we've started to update the program and we'll be rolling out that new design shortly. So without Further ado, I'd like to hand it back to Anna Laura for our topic tonight about sustainable costume design. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Shira. Um, so the film industry is an inherently wasteful industry, uh, and that includes the costume industry. It's estimated that a typical film or TV drama will, it will use more clothing than the average person uses in their lifetime and will produce more waste in a week than the average household in a year. Costume design and, costume design and production are linked to the global fashion industry, uh, which produces eight to 10% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and in New York City every year, the municipal garbage is filled with 1.4 billion pounds of clothing and other textile that could have otherwise been reused or recycled. Um, the global textile industry has a huge social and environmental impact with the majority of textiles in the world produced in developing countries producing significant social and environmental impact. The manufacture of textiles requires an abundance of natural resources, land use, water, trees, energy, crude oil, um, producing an immense, immense amount of carbon emissions. Um, uh, producing immense in carbon emissions, pollutants, and waste. Uh, and waste. And as a massive consumer, the costume department has the capacity to use its tremendous buying power um, to operate in a far more socially and environmentally responsible manner and truly change um, the industry for the better. So I'm being told that my voice is really low. Um, I'm gonna try to speak louder, but I am definitely speaking loud. <laughs> um, please keep saying in the chat, if you can't hear me, um, I'll try to speak even louder into my mic. Um, so, uh, Noel, if you want to go back a slide, I just want to explain the circular economy a little bit, or forward a slide. There we go. So, um, we require a significant shift from a linear economy model to a circular economy. The standard approach has been the linear economy, where we take materials out of the ground, we use them to make products, and we throw those products away. Uh, we're now seeing a shift away from the wasteful and polluting approach and moving towards a circular economy. This is an economy where products are designed to not become waste, to keep them in use, and where we restore and protect our natural world and resources. And it focuses on how we manage resources, how we make and use products, and what we do with the materials afterwards. In this way, the life cycle of a product is extended. And regarding the costume department, we have the opportunity to promote and further circularity by sharing, by leasing, reusing, remanufacturing, repairing, refurbishing and recycling existing costumes as long as they can um, to prolong the life cycle of a variety of items used in performances. And so what's important about examining the life cycle analysis of materials, the life cycle analysis is the act of measuring the environmental impact of a product or service throughout its life cycle. Um, from the resources used to create the product or service across its use um, by the user to its final end of life destination. Um, and this helps us to understand how different products and services when designed differently can reduce the impact that we have on the planet. Um, so that was just a little bit of an intro um, and it will lead me into introducing our wonderful panelists for the night. Um, I hope that you all can hear me better. Uh, please feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, Okay, so don't turn my head to the right. Let me see if I can move my laptop there. Maybe that'll help a little bit. Thank you for the input. Okay, um, so we have our lovely panelists. We are joined together, uh, together today by Kristen Ahern, 
Jennifer Berger, Catherine Uwali, Serge Lazarev, and Helen Uckner. Um, Kristen is, in 2018, Kristen founded Conscious Costume with a mission to educate and empower costume professionals by providing resources and community to galvanize a more ethical, inclusive, and circular world. Um, and through this work, she's also hosted events with community groups, circular businesses, and universities nationally and internationally. Um, and in 2019, Conscious Costume launched Costume Rentals to pioneer a new way to share costume resources as living art materials in shared abundance. Uh, Jennifer Berzer is a personal stylist and costume professional in IOSC Local US uh, 829 and has been based in New York City for the past five years. Uh, most recently, she was the costume coordinator for Pretty Little Liars Original Sin um, and also somewhere in Queens, High Maintenance, Master, and The Photograph. She's also an ambassador for the sustainable fashion organization Remake, um, which, fight, which is a global advocacy organization fighting for fair pay and climate justice in the clothing industry. Catherine Uwali is a multimedia bio artist, social and environmental activist, costumer, and storyteller. And her work challenges the need to use materials and methods that are non-compatible with living systems. Um, she is an Ontario Green Screen Ambassador. She's a costume member of IOSC 873, CAFTAD, and the Costume Society of America. She's also the co-founder of S Biotica Material Research and Design Studio in Barcelona. Um, and her work with innovation in textiles has received awards and mentorship from the European Commission, Caring, and Vogue Business. Um, she's also designed a course on sustainable costume design. Um, Serge is the founder of Green Tree Textile Recycling, which is a nonprofit organization in New York City um, with a mission to keep all unwanted post-consumer textile recycle, uh, materials from entering the waste stream um, to maximize the benefits that come from recycling textiles. Um, for the, for the environment and the community. Um, and they connect with fashion brands to arrange pickups and shipping of their textile recycling collected products. Um, and the materials transfer to their sorting facility in the Bronx where team members sort the garments for either reuse or recycling. Um, and Helen Uffner is the founder of Helen Uffner um, Vintage Clothing. And she's been recy renting, recycled and restored authentic 1860s through about 1980s men's, women's, and children's clothing and accessories to the entertainment industry for the past 45 years. Clients range from feature films to episodic TV to theaters across the country and abroad. Um, and she, um, sorry, I've lost my my plate. Um, so so basically, she um, she rents these these items. She keeps she restores items. Um, and she keeps vintage items out of landfill. Um, she works with theaters and designers who donate vintage pieces or well-made theatrical pieces in return for a monetary credit to the theater or designer for the future product. Um, and due to developers, Helen is now looking for a new space to continue the business um, or a new business investor. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, welcome panelists. All right, so I'm not sure what's going on with my volume, but apparently my volume's not wonderful. Uh, unless I restart my computer right now, I, I don't know what else to do, um, but hopefully you all can continue to hear me okay. Um, please let me know if that is not the case. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, so I want to get started with uh, the costumers in, um, in the group. We have Catherine, we have Jennifer, we have Kristen. Um, what does it mean for you to design um, for circularity? What does it mean and how can we better design with circularity in mind? Um, Catherine, let's start with you. Uh, and that's a super broad question because there's actually so many little things that we can do in our department to design uh, with more circularity in mind. Um, anywhere from like the more obvious, which is like, you know, taking into account like shopping 
secondhand and vintage um, to using like more natural chemicals and dyes in our processes to sourcing more um, sustainable textiles and natural textiles uh, for building and uh, even like down to the chemicals and the packaging that we use for washing laundering our clothes um, yeah to all the garment bags that we use like what like sourcing different alternatives for those plastic bags that we use like millions of so I think it's um, depends on your practice and like what you're already implementing in your department and um, just starting small and like making those like a ritual habit in your department and then building up from there. So, so there's lots of options, which is the exciting part. Those are great points. Um, any other inputs from the other costumes? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely echo everything that Catherine said. I think the other question that I um, often ask people to reflect on is, does that piece actually need to be built from scratch? I think there's a lot of pressure to build something new and that, um, that that's sort of sometimes seen as being a more authentic design that's that's more yours because you designed that garment but I kind of push back against that and say we're costume designers we're not garment designers and and by saying that you know you designing the garment from scratch is more valid that's that's saying that a, a shop design a contemporary design is less valid than a, a period or historic or fantasy design and I don't think that's true I think that's a that's you know uh not not our craft um so just really evaluating um sort of where the different pieces could come from and instead of just defaulting to building. Hmm. Um, I was just going to add, um, I think like thinking about the circularity part of things like at the very beginning of your process and like thinking about the end use like at the beginning is like pretty important like when you're buying things like buy better quality maybe so that it can be like reused over and over again. Um, or rented out or something like that. Um, and also I took notes. Um, yeah, I think in renting in general, um, like if you just rent in the first place, you don't have to buy it and then you can just like give it back at the end and then you don't have to worry about it at all. Um, I think just keeping that in mind um, and like you guys also said, yeah, all those little things really add up. And I think like this conversation is just important. Like every little thing matters anyway. So, yeah. Those are all great points, thank you. And uh, along those lines, how do you source those those materials that are better for the initial, um, you know, where do you rent? Where do you source sustainable materials to make into those designs? Um, again, for the costumers. I guess. Kristen? Well, speaking about New York City specifically, I don't have that particular scope and or lens so I can start more broad and maybe you uh, can like narrow in on your practice there in New York um but definitely like there's sources aside from like just looking at like local craft shows which I think are cool to just like um first of all connect with your local designers like who um you can support their work it's like zero kilometers zero kind of sourcing which is like ideal um and having them like assist you and support you in making pieces or like sourcing or like leave that part to them because they that's what they do is like sourcing for their sustainable like uh brands that they have um you can also look at some really good um websites like good on you or the good trade if you're uncertain you're a shopper because they have huge lists like you can just type in uh sustainable underwear you know like things like that you basics that you need to like more specific like jeans or like outerwear or like you know anything and they'll give you a run through of like all different brands pros and cons where they're sourcing um brands who say certain things that they're doing but they're not actually adhering to them so they're really really good uh, online resources um as well as the costume directory because they're like global so you can actually search on there at anywhere that you more or less like any hub in the world there's some kind of brand that you, you can source locally that is doing some sustainable, either sustainable designs or like textile recycling or like crafting hubs. So yeah, that's those three are really good for, for uh, buyers and designers. That's great. Uh, feel free to enter those into the chat. I'm sure uh, many, many people would like to know about those directories. Um, Kristen, Jennifer, do you have any other 
I was going to add, uh, as a remake ambassador, remake also has a directory on their website, and I was looking at it earlier today, and there were even brands that I like hadn't really heard of before that they have um, like, you know, gone through, and they have really long lists of like what they're doing well and what they're not doing so well, um, and it kind of just you know is a broad look at the different aspects of sustainability and um, human rights and things too. So I can put that in the chat as well. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up those like third party review reviewers and rating agencies because I think that they're so useful for us. You don't have to do all the research yourself. There's one place that you can look and someone has has done that because uh, greenwashing is a huge problem. Um, like Catherine, I think that there's a lot of really great resources online. Uh, there's more than ever for secondhand shopping online. There's Poshmark, there's ThreadUp, there's um, uh, Etsy is still great. So those are great resources for finding things secondhand. Um, and Etsy, or Etsy and Poshmark now both also have um, uh, both have return or not return options. They both have fabric options now. They both have um, like a specific materials tab, and then ThreadUp can do returns. So I know returns are very important for a lot of designers. So knowing that there's somewhere you can shop secondhand and still return things, I think, is really helpful. Um, the other sort of more responsible choice that uh, I encourage people to think about, like if you are like, if you have to buy the conventional thing, you have to buy polyester, you have to buy a plastic zipper, whatever it is, you have to buy the conventional thing, um, consider buying it from a small business, consider buying it from a black owned business, a queer owned business. Like that's another way that we can have an impact with our budget, um, even if we have to buy the conventional plastic cheap material, at least it could go to benefit someone in a community rather than a big box retailer. Oh, those are all really great insights. Thank you. Um, but along that as well, um, in sourcing materials and sourcing more sustainable, um, we do want to talk about renting uh, costuming or costumes as well. So Helen, um, tell us a little bit about the work that you do with renting costumes and um, how many productions work with you. Oh my gosh, a lot. I, I had to write it down because I couldn't remember. <laughs> um, what we do is we buy um, or, you know, accept donations, we restore, and we, we cover more than 100 years of clothing. So if you're doing a period show, we also allow you to memo things, take things on approval, so you don't have to rent them outright, you can take them for fittings. Um, and then what happens if something gets ruined, um, rather than even charging a replacement value, we'll accept things that the production had bought for their production. So then we can recycle those in turn. Um, when we get things back that are no longer in good shape and we can't restore and then rent to another production, what we do is uh, materials for the arts, we donate to them, or we have a bin where we donate to um, schools or other productions that are low budget that can perhaps make something out of something that partially fell apart, but they can still make use of it. Um, we also recycle everything. We recycle tissue paper, plastic bags, hangers, and we often put on um, online when we have extras if any production needs them. So we do that all the time. We do it on last looks. That's uh, an online uh, discussion group. Amazing. So a production would come to you, rent out all their costumes, um, and then return the costumes to you. Right. They'll either do that or let's say we're, we're doing um, two things that are out of town now. They'll tell us what, we, what they need and they'll give us sizes and color palette. We'll choose for them, we'll take pictures and then we'll send it to them on approval. They're not obligated to take it. And then when they decide what they want then we write up the rental. So we make it very easy for everybody. And so we do a lot in New York but we do a lot out of New York as well. Good to know, thank you. Sure. Um, and another question for the costumers, um, in your experiences, and feel free to share uh, certain case studies that, that you've had, what have been some of the biggest challenges in pursuing sustainable um, alternatives in the costume department? Um, you know, time or budget constraints, it, what are the, some of the biggest challenges? We could start with Jennifer. You're muted. 
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, definitely time is a huge one. Um, as we all know, like it's really like we never get enough prep time, like during filming, like things change constantly. And then like at the end, you know, people just want to be out of the building and as quickly as possible. Um, I think it's really important to like, yeah, be aware of these resources at the beginning. Um, and maybe like um even like before you like to before you start the project even like necessarily like it's good to have these um just at our disposal and like sharing it like we're doing um because like in the moment it's really hard to like take the time to research and like choose the best option sometimes um for like materials and like also a part of it is like the design um like sometimes just finding the perfect thing at the right time um that doesn't have to be like shipped super quickly um or is like local is just really challenging um because you I mean the design is really important um overall um I think that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah no definitely <laughs> so you would say um the time constraints I think the time thing. constraints is a big one um budget as well obviously um and those kind of go hand in hand um, but I think the time constraints is is pretty pretty essential. Um, yeah. Any other input? Oh, absolutely, time. I 100% agree with everything that Jennifer said. I I could do it within the budget if I had more time. Um, there's I just think we really are desperate for a big culture shift. I, I mean, in theater and film, but like also like in the world that like we expect everything to be instantaneous, and it is it is bad. Uh, you know, it is harming people. It is harming us for like the stress and anxiety of trying to get this done. But also, you know, there's there's that idea that like someone is paying somewhere. Like just because we're doing it super fast and getting it, um, it is it is causing harm. Right. Yeah, I, I think that the problem from my end is that um, more often than not, productions have last minute um, needs, and they call us and they need things, and they don't even have an actor yet. They don't have actor sizes. And that's really the fault of, of the production side, not of the costume designer. They're just waiting. So it makes it very hard on the costume designer. And it'll also increase the budget because they need those things on set right away, whether they're going to fit the actor that they finally choose or not. So I, I find that to be a difficulty at, for costume designers from my end. Hmm. Yeah, and I would say like as far as using more natural materials, like unless the aesthetic of the project that you're working on, like immediately shouts, you know, like linen, silks and all these things, like people are very resistant to that, you know, there's like um, just a fetish of using like a lot of synthetics, which is uh, fine if you're giving it a second life and you're sourcing things from like vintage um, renting and like secondhand. There's tons of really cool clothes that are made out there. If we stopped producing clothes like globally today, we could live until like <laughs> we could live like hundreds of years. still with all the clothes that we have made. So it's like we can make films for sure with secondhand and vintage and uh, repurposing and upcycling fabrics and clothes. Um, but yeah, I, like as far as like for builds and like for breakdown, which is kind of like more what I was in doing the last few years, um, I just find that, yeah, like matching colors for like natural dyes and it's like a more time consuming, again, uh, process. So again, like time consuming and like a specific vision in mind. And so matching impossible things that only exist like in this one universe. And then you're trying to get like 10 exact uh, duplicates of that for like all of your action scenes. Um, so yeah, there's sometimes like the quicker, cheaper, easier way is like the more toxic way, unfortunately um it's yeah it, like it's exactly as Kristen said you we need a massive uh shift in perception of like what our priorities are because it's also just also harming the workers and the people that break down artists and yeah it's incredibly um harmful yeah I mean it can be extremely exploitative uh the labor practices in these these associated with the fashion industry. We can have a whole conversation about that. Um, but it sounds like budget and time constraints um, seem to be the, some of the biggest challenges. So when you have spent potentially on some of your projects, uh, a little bit more on 
um, you know, seeking these al sustainable alternatives, um, how did how were you able to navigate that into your budget? Were you, did you have a lot of hoops to go through? Uh, uh, Jennifer, did, do you have any input I can there? Talk about it. Um, so yeah, like what happens a lot of the time is you kind of like go through the script and then yeah, break down the budget and then you kind of like present it um, and then it either you know gets approved or not or tweaked. Um, and so like I think like kind of like back what I said at the beginning, like thinking about sustainability when you're just like breaking down everything and like when you are presenting your budget in general um, and like, or if you're given like a specific number, like thinking about how that will go into all of your little things, like the actual clothing, but then there's like cleaning costs too that could go up because you're trying to use like green or dry cleaners or, you know, more effort goes into like the wet cleaning and stuff or laundry detergents and things like that. Um, a lot of the time, like I have broken out like shipping costs too. And so like just putting, I guess, more money into that shipping is obviously, um, you know, detrimental in like a not cost way too, because getting things all over the place is really harmful. Um, and, but like, sometimes, you know, you want to get that like rental thing that's in California. And so you might put like more shipping into your budget um, to get that like special thing. Um, to be reused again instead of just buying something on Amazon that's like free shipping um, and I don't know and then I guess also someone was saying returns um, at one point like that kind of factors into the budget too because on a lot of the things I've worked on we like overbuy right and then we have to return stuff to get that money back um, and it's just it can be like difficult um you know you want to choose like better companies where like you might not you know like people throw things away a lot of the time um for like returns or like it's just their logistics you know can't necessarily keep up with the returns that like our industry might cause them um and so it's kind of being smart again in the beginning when you're like purchasing things um because we have to do returns but like maybe we can do a smarter way of you know like where we purchase things in general um to get that money back um yeah I think mean, does that make sense <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. does okay. cool <laughs> definitely does uh, um yeah have you have has anybody ever sourced recycled fabrics um from like companies like green tree recycling um has that been something that has been hard to do on you know a, a, again the time constraints I'm, sh I'm sure it's a little difficult to source these recycled materials to make a costume um but is that something that you that is ever something that you can wiggle into uh, your costumes yeah i i've sourced i've sourced from fab scrap before there's also a really wonderful vintage store in brooklyn called stella dallas uh, Stella Dallas Living, they do vintage, uh, they have tons of vintage buttons and vintage fabrics, which is just awesome. Um, so yeah, I've definitely used recycled fabrics before. I think it goes to um, being perhaps more open-minded about what you're looking for. You might not be able to find the perfect color or the perfect print because you have a, a smaller selection uh, if you are trying to stick to something that is a secondhand fabric. Um, so being like really clear on what you need for that design, like, is it more important that it is floral or is it more important that it is light blue or, or whatever it is, um, just, you know, having a, a broader design eye for it. Um, and Jennifer, thank you so much for bringing up the issue of uh, returns, because I do think that's something we count on a lot in our budgets is, oh, we're just going to buy a whole bunch of stuff, we'll try it on. So almost all of your returns, again, to sort of your major retailers are going in the are going in the garbage. They're going in the landfill. And I'm really sorry to be the bearer of bad news on that, but it is um, it is the case. And we we have become really dependent on that two day shipping and free returns to buy boxes and boxes of things and then return it all. And it is I, I don't know what the impact of just costumes is, but it's got to be massive just knowing like the productions I've worked on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning, the impact of the sustainable costume department is, or the costume department, sorry, is is huge, um, and the amount, the volume is is also huge. So you can, a lot of those aren't even being used. It's just returns that are just ending up in landfill because a lot of these, they do not get sold again. 
Um, and that's just the reality of it. Uh, I just want to say something also that even yes. though we rent, um, I often buy things only because the pieces are beautiful. So we do sell a lot of trim, like period trim, if you want to build something. So we have buttons, we have uh, trim and lace and collars and things like that. So we make, we make that accessible all the time. I don't think a lot of people know about it, but we do. Thank you. That's, that's great. Um, great information. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned something when you, oh, sorry. Yes, Catherine. I was just going to say, um, if you are doing a lot of shows often like, um, or even like garments, um, I've sourced a lot of like recycled, for instance, fabrics from Econil and things like this for like active wear. So like, but, um, I have like a big swatch book that they send. So it's like nice to just have that instead of like buying a bunch of fabrics that you're potentially not going to use and just you know, like keep those in your, um, yeah, in your folders and your binders. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, so Jennifer, you mentioned uh, wet, wet and dry cleaning. Um, so this was something that I, I had a question about. Um, in, and I, maybe this is a question for the costume, but also Helen, because um, I know that you, you, also have dry cleaning, wet cleaning services with your costumes. Are there aspects of dry and wet cleaning services that people and fellow customers should know about? Um, is there a preference? Teach us. Uh, uh, Helen, do you wanna go ahead? For us, um, uh, we prefer that obviously things like men's suits and, and woolen things be dry cleaned. Um, cottons and linens, believe it or not, this is how I spend my weekends. I'm at home cleaning things naturally with, you know, with, with uh, natural cleansers and hanging them up all over my bathroom. Um, so I, I prefer that, that, you know, especially early authentic pieces be hand washed rather than dry cleaned over and over. I think dry clean, dry cleaning tends to ruin fabrics, but some things have to be dry cleaned, even, um, let's say crepe dresses or, or men's suits, things like that. We, we have no choice. But is there one that is potentially better uh, or more sustainable? In terms of where one sends it, you mean? Um, well, I yeah. like to use natural cleaners, but it's not up to me. Unfortunately, it's the production that chooses where it goes. And very often they, they don't necessarily go for the best, they go for the cheapest that does bulk cleaning. And you can ask the designers if that's so, but that's what I've noticed when it comes back. Mm -hmm. It depends. I've worked on some period shows where we've used wet cleaners. Um, I mean, they've been like period shows with a lot of builds, like it was uh, rain. So, you know, it's like a kind of like Gossip Girl take on like Mary Queen of Scots. So it was like not really like proper period wear all the time there were um but yeah it, it was like a really good service uh the only thing is it, I think it depends on the stains particularly like um because oils are like not soluble in water and wet cleaning does involve some water that is like the difference between wet and dry cleaning dry cleaning is just like dry solvents but yeah of course like dry cleaning is like one of the most um I think you can find like more eco-friendly dry cleaners but you're, but there's still dry cleaners out there that use like, for instance, perk, which is like one of the most like carcinogenic, <laughs> volatile uh, toxins that there are uh, that exists. So yeah, um, just by very, very little exposure, it's like carcinogenic, like neurotoxins. Uh, yeah, all the bad the degenerative body things that you don't want to be exposed to. So, so yeah, the wet cleaning is a little bit better. It's not like, it, all the all say sends like organic everything but it's definitely not using like the harsh chemicals that dry cleaning is but again like Helen said like a wool suit yeah you want to probably get that dry cleaned yeah and I would just um add to think you know I the all the harmful chemicals that are in conventional dry cleaning there are I did a little research into this a couple of years ago and so I'm, I'm trying to like go back in my brain archive about that. Um, but I think that there's two methods. One uses CO2 instead of perk. One uses silicone like beads 
that that strip the the sweat and grime off of it. Um, but if you are trying to use like a green dry cleaner, make sure that they tell you what the process is either on their website or they can answer questions about it. Because I have seen so many dry cleaners recently just throw organic over it, but they don't back that up with any information. They've just all of a sudden all their logos are in greens and have leaves and they're called like clean cleaners or something. There's a lot of greenwashing in the dry cleaning world. So don't pay more for the same stuff. Don't pay more for branding. Yes, definitely. Um, so you bring up greenwashing, um, but so you, you're constrained with budget and time. So if you have to um, purchase off the rack clothing, how do you minimize your impact or how can you minimize your impact if you have to go through that? How do you avoid greenwashing? Um, look at labels, that kind of thing. Um, Kristen, do you want to start that off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's the stuff we mentioned earlier, those third-party rating systems, Remake, Good On You, they're great. Um, and again, they do that work for you. Uh, if, you're, if you're on the company's website and you're trying to find out what's going on, again, always transparency. Um, you want to see, you know, you don't want something that just says ethically made. You want to see that it is um, fair trade or certified or, or something really specific about what they mean. I honestly really respect companies that also talk about like their gap, like, okay, we've made this out of 50% recycled materials and we're hoping it's going to be 70% recycled materials by um, 2030 or whatever, or, you know, we are working towards a living wage. Currently, half of our stuff is still produced in Bangladesh and in not good factories, but we are working on that and just being open with you as the consumer. Um, so just always look for transparency and details. All right. Uh, any other info? Oh, yeah. Jen. I was going to say, um, yeah, be careful of like the buzzwords, like people, you know, use, especially circularity is a big, a big one that uh, like Zara, I think, like came out with something recently, um, you know, and then there's um, vegan, I think is a big one like that. A lot of the time it's just like plastic, like you just have to do, you know, just use your brain and like use some research and like actually look at like what the materials are, because there are companies out there doing really cool things. I mean, if, if you have like an actor that wants to be vegan, you know, it's really um, important to like, you know, honor their values and things, but you also don't want to just put them in like a plastic dress, you know? Um, so just, yeah, just, um, using those certifications and things, those resources, I think is really important. I just put a link in the chat for everyone. The sustainable production toolkit is a wonderful guide. And, um, uh, Laura Gaston, who's the costume contributor to that guide created a really robust list of certifications that can help you know if something is real or if it's greenwashing. Great. Yeah, also looking at like the fiber content, if it's made from recycled fabrics, like you're saying, like you don't want to put somebody in just like in a plastic dress or whatever, but you know, maybe that plastic dress is at least recycled. So it's like at least one step better. Um, and also if you're buying um, like a ton of stuff from like, you know, your big box stores, um just getting some samples first I think is like super important and like getting approval instead of like buying a ton of things and then like trying to return them later I feel like like we're very guilty of overbuying and I've just yeah like often stuff ends up being dead stock because it just gets really busy nobody knows like you know, there's nobody to even like do the returns. And then you're like, whose credit card was this on? <laughs> and like things just slip through the cracks. And then you end up with like racks of random clothes that like don't have a use. So yeah, that's a very real thing that also happens on production. So I think, especially if you're buying just because it's like cheap and it's like three for five dollars or something, which like in that in and of itself is like super alarming, <laughs> but uh. But yeah, um, just be mindful of like getting some samples, getting approvals and make, being sure of what you're buying. It sounds that with, you know, there's budget constraints, but it sounds like it sometimes ends up being even more expensive because you're buying so much. Um, so interesting. Um, in looking at the best kinds of materials, uh, what are the best quality materials for durability? And I'll, I'll direct this question to Serge here because 
you know, you're dealing with um, recycled fabrics or collecting these fabrics. So what would you say are the most durable materials um, for longevity? So in terms of a post, uh, post life uh, when the when a garment can't be used as a garment anymore the best materials are the uh, pure materials such as cotton or wool or cashmere because then those materials can be used as other things down the line uh, for example to give you cotton can e either be uh, made into wiping cloth and uh, ca cashmere and wool can be respun right if you have a mixture of the materials it's really hard to break them down and we do have an avenue for uh, recycling of those materials, uh, but the the materials that are um, natural have two or three lifespans, right? So you could use a, a wiping cloth uh, once, twice, maybe you could wash it. And then after you're done using a swiper cloth, you could bring it uh, back to us again. And, and the next time around, it'll just get shredded and become a part of textile insulation. And now it could live in somebody's wall or ceiling for another, 50 years as insulation, rather than have a, a some kind of a petroleum-based material which can't be used as a wiping cloth because it has no absorption, it, it can't be respun, and it will it will still become a, 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 as a part of textile insulation, but just has one less use. And I think it's important to have as many uses as possible because, like you said, it's it's a, a lot of overproduction of clothing and a lot of over shopping it, and and the amount of waste that you mentioned in the beginning from textiles is it's enormous it's it's just enormous and we deal with it every day and, and it just keeps growing and growing so the, yeah the best materials uh, to get back to it is the materials that are natural natural fibers cotton wool cashmere great um and can the costumers add any intel on like can you influence the materials that you're using on your productions or does it always follow like a look instead? Um, Catherine, you wanna add anything? Yeah, you can definitely influence the materials that are being used. Um, it definitely, there's like a look and style, but you're like co-creating this, you're pitching. And so if you're good, you have like a good team of buyers or like you have a good resource of where you're getting like some, even like, for instance, if you wanted to, I was talking to Gersha Phillips, who's like the designer for Star Trek, and we were talking about mushroom leathers that she tried for Star Trek, um, because I work kind of in that field now of like making biomaterials. So yeah, there's, there's like avenues where you could try different things where like, you sometimes don't need to like you know get clearance for like having a certain look you just need to make the look really strong and pitch it and like have the story around it and um that's you know like the new norm so perfect uh you bring up biomaterials um what are some catherine i'll direct this to you what are some interesting materials that you that you've used in your designs uh, with biological materials? Yeah, so I mean, for like Ayatsu, let's say I've only really used like natural dyes. That's like as far as that's gone. And for more like art film and my own uh, material research studio, we've created algae-based like bioplastics. They're like silicone kind of looking materials. Um, so we made, um, yeah, we've made like several different uh, costumes with that material uh, that we really like. And also mycelium and bacterial cellulose, which is like a SCOBY kind of material. And there's all kinds of like weird things that are coming out there. And they're definitely like more on the artistic side, some of them, but they're actually like companies that are doing this uh, on, a, on a scale um, and that I think are really good partnerships for the um, for us as costumers because we can give them like visibility uh, and we can also give them feedback in like a smaller scale rather than them like producing things for um, mass market you know we're like have a smaller scale they like sometimes have a shorter lifespan they have like very specific 
needs that they need to um, fulfill. And then we can say like, okay, this is like how this material is reacting now. And these are um, the kind of requirements or like the kind of feedback that we will give you. And so that's like a really good way that we can help actually advance that field. It doesn't seem like related, but I, I think it's like a, a really good place for those uh, biomaterials to um, be tested. Actually, there's also one brand called Skitter, and they are like a plant-based um, water repellent spray. And they specifically partner with, uh, I, they partnered with our costume department um, because they wanted feedback from our department um, to know like how their product was, um, yeah, how their product was act reacting with different textiles and in different scenarios. Um, so that they could move on to their next production um, past like proof of concept and minimal viable products. So yeah, that's, um, and yeah, if you're interested in that skitter, I can pop the link on there as well. So, so yeah. Uh, thank you. Have there been other interesting recycled materials that you've used into your costumes um, for the other costumers as well? Uh, Kristen, Jennifer? Any? used a lot of cardboard um but that's been more in like weird structured things and puppets um ty those tyvek envelopes are really good if you're doing something like costume craft focus i feel like it's more in crafts that i've i've found um interesting upcycled materials i also want to shout out an organization in chicago uh, called the Waste Shed, their creative reuse center like materials for the arts. And every winter they do um, what's called the discard disco where you get like a surprise box of materials and you have to create a look with it. And it's been really fascinating seeing um, what people create with some of the very strange materials because some of it is conventional like, you know, fabric and stuff that's been donated, but a lot of it is very strange and seeing what the artists do with it is just a really good source of inspiration for how something could be used. That's interesting. Uh, okay. Um, and now looking towards the afterlife of these costumes um, and after they've been used, what have you done with these, uh, with these or what have been some uh, methods for dealing with these costumes? Um, Catherine, you mentioned that sometimes there's racks of clothing that you can't return. So what do you do to promote uh, or what have you done on your on your sets to promote circularity? Well, there's there's a lot of avenues I think you can take here. It depends like what it is that you have. Um, yeah, you can definitely share with other productions um, in your union um just let them know like hey send this out to like all the costume department members we have all these racks of i don't know white extra large fruit of the loom t-shirts random but like anyone can use that you know what i mean so like i'm surely somebody else is doing a production somewhere that can take that off your hands and you can like mediate their um what price for that um you can also um yeah like donate them to um a, a vintage store or secondhand store and get some credit from for your next production or like if you're ongoing like just for the next period of time um yeah those are a couple of things that you can do but there's there's really a ton of things that you can do if you're like on facebook groups as well like helen was mentioning it's also like costume queen uh you can just yeah you can just let people let people know what you have like someone will take it someone will use it like let's keep it in let's keep it in the department also like thinking outside of costumes your buy nothing group your free cycle group i've gotten rid of so many fabric scraps that way i had like a mom who just wanted glittery things for her kids to play with during the pandemic i got rid of a couple bags that way um you know any way you can find for it to be reused rather than recycled is is a better choice um, I wanted to say I've used a lot of times the like donate NYC website, like the directory. Um, I can stick a link in there, but it's really helpful for finding like shelters, like just like places around New York City that will actually use um, the items instead of just like Salvation Army or, you know, Goodwill that are going to like resell it. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's important. I can find that link. Yeah, perfect. I was going to say exactly that, Jennifer. I think that's super important. There's one uh, that I've used in Toronto called Close Off Your Rack, and it's similar. Like, if you can find like shelters or anything like this, there's also 
um, some organizations that work with people that are like don't have the resources to get like new um, outfits for uh, interviews and for like getting jobs. One here is called Dress for Success, and I'm sure there's like similar things all over wherever your hub is. And are you ever able to potentially store? the costumes as well? Is there like somewhere you can store them and keep them for further productions? So that's sort of what Conscious Costume was, our rentals was founded to do, um, was, you know, I, so the Chicago Grand Theater Alliance does a costume swap every year, but there are always like bags and bags of stuff left over afterwards. Um, so Conscious Costume sort of came in to like fill that gap because, you know, often there'd be people a few weeks later going, oh, I wish I'd grabbed that because now I know that I need it. So um, keeping some of those things in the ecosystem, I will say from like a circularity perspective, we have more people who like to use it to get rid of things than to source things. And I am, you know, if there's anyone here who uh, is designing a show, we are happy to ship. Um, but also if you are designing a show in Chicago, we're local to there. Uh, so yeah, trying to provide storage because I, talking to other costume professionals, that was always the issue was storage. That if we were pulling it, you know, sometimes it was in a director, an artistic director's basement and it was very unorganized and hard to find things. Wouldn't it be great if we had like this great shared space, like space was what we really needed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something I'm aiming to uh, provide a bit of a Band-Aid for at least in one small region. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like a lot of costumers or anyone in film would, would benefit from just being able to store their things. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, so I'm working on a project right now um, to create like an app or a website or something where you can sort of upload pictures of everything that you have and like sort of have decentralized storage, but like better insights into what everyone has. So you don't have to go onto the Facebook group and go, does anyone have this or that? But like, there's a community that you can hopefully search as easily as you can search, you know, an online store and get a sense of like, okay, these are all of the size 32 tux pants within 10 miles of where I am right now. Um, it is very much a work in progress, but hopefully something that will exist because it's, uh, I think it would be a really cool way to share our resources and decentralize that storage. Just want to add quickly that that's often how a lot of rental stores or rental um, houses have started. It's just like actually costume designers that have kept all their kits. And then sometimes they've partnered up with other costume designers who have kept their kits and then they like get a space and they start renting and then it grows. And, and yeah, there, there's a lot of that. There's some more um, like modern ones also, I think, that are starting to pop up, which is kind of cool. It is six o'clock, so that does um, end the panel part, uh, but maybe I'll just close it off with, before we get to the questions, you all have offered so many great, um, valuable options for costumers to pursue sustainability. But if they're constrained with time, if they're constrained with budgets, what would you say is like the one thing? Like the, the if they can only do one little thing on their next show, what would you say should be the top priority? Um, Kristen, do you want to start? Oh, it's really hard. <laughs> um, I think just try to source one more thing sustainably than you did last time. Um, you know, if you've already if you've never done anything before, if you've never prioritized sustainability, um, just do it once. Just pick one costume and say, I'm gonna to try to find this. Um, is it shoes? Is it undershirts? Is it socks? I mean, undershirts and socks and undergarments are, are relatively easy to find a more ethically produced um, option for. Um, so yeah, just get started. Stop, stop letting perfection be the enemy of progress and just get started. Wonderfully put. Wonderfully put. Uh, unless anybody else wants to add anything to that, um, we can. Oh, Catherine. Yeah, I want to go off of the clothes thing and say bags like 
bring your own bags if you're a shopper or like buy the reusable bag of the store if you just like want to save face with the store when you're doing returns like there's a lot of stores like Saks has their own reusable bags and uh, like the bay like all of these places they all normally are doing that it's like pretty uh contemporary practice that all these big box stores have like their own uh bags so that and also like don't throw away Ziplocs and shoe bags and boot bags because you use them once and they look kind of fugly. Like nobody cares, just use them until they're fully, like you need to throw them out because that's also a thing for sure. The amount of plastic that we use is insane. Yeah, I would say, and I and Christian's idea is great by the way, but I would say if you're doing a show, don't be afraid to contact other small theaters to ask if they might have done that show and they might have exactly the items you're looking for and you won't have to build anything from scratch and you can recycle something that's already existing. Amazing. Like Kristen said, work in community. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, perfect. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, I see lots of questions have been um, put into the chat. Um, Jen, do you want to open up the questions or I uh, haven't been able to follow the questions? Yeah, um, I can, um, I just, I can read off the questions. Um, hold on, let me just, uh, <clears throat> so um, we have one, sorry, um, that I, um, that we got earlier, how can the city help facilitate the deacquisition process at the end of a production? So any comments or suggestions from our from our panelists? Most welcome. I mean, from what I understand, uh, FabScrap was the foundation of FabScrap was partially funded by city money. Um, because there are certain requirements and restrictions of how much fabric waste can go in a dumpster for uh, textile producers and garment producers in New York. So that that circularity exists because the city said enough waste is enough waste. So I think um, I know a lot of people are sort of against regulations, but I think by saying you have to be responsible for what you're getting rid of, uh, a government can have an influence on this. Yeah, I, I would say just uh, research who are the textile recyclers in your area and, and contact them. And uh, it, it, the most 99% of the time, they'll be willing to accept the merchandise that you have. Just a little note on what Kristen said as well, Abstrap, um, the fee that you pay for recycling with them is like, um, you can get a tax receipt for that because they're like a non for profit So you can actually get that money back, which like for productions is a big deal, all the tax breaks that you can get. So that's a way that you can advocate in your budget for these kinds of processes. It's like, oh, well, we can get a tax break by actually recycling our, our scraps. Well, that's great. Uh, I do see another question that's come in um, from Begonia Burgess. Uh, my name is Begonia Burgess. I would like to ask which organization you would suggest to dispose of clothes that are no longer usable, recyclable, or fixable, like pieces that are stained with lots of fake blood, um, cut for SFX rigging, or have been heavily distressed? Uh, I think Sarah, you would have. Yeah, I would answer. Yeah. It's, it, this is very complicated because in order to recycle clothing for our process, in order to, to make clothing into textile insulation, the materials have to not, cannot be contaminated, such as fake blood and paint. You know, if it's slightly contaminated, it's okay. But, but if, it's, if the whole cloth is like covered in, in heavy paint, that material is no longer valid for textile insulation. Uh, I don't know how you would recycle that. I don't know. It, this is this is something we deal with all the time. You know, uh, materials come in, and the uh, uh, things are many things are very complicated to deconstruct, right? Whether whether it's paint stains or they have too many zippers, buttons, or just too many materials. So that you run into an issue of you know how how much time is it going to take 
to pull off all the stuff and put it into separate categories. And what kind of volume are you going to get out of these categories so the textile recycler will accept it? You know, uh, and, and where do you store it? it? It's very, it's a very complicated situation. I, I, if if it's slightly stained, it can be done. But if it's if it's heavy, if it's heavy stained, we can't do it. Any other comments? I was going to say, I think that's where like rental houses and costume places can come in handy again, because like we do all kind of need those distressed garments. And especially if it's not like super identifiable or something like on Pretty Little Liars, we had a whole like background, you know, scene where they were all had to be a little bit dirty and things. And then we ended up donating that to a new um, costume rental upstate. Um, I think they're called two old biddies shout out, but, um, they, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that's also where like last looks can come in. If you like have a big rack of things that, I mean, aren't super specific, um, for, you know, being shot or whatever, um, possibly that could be reused by somebody else and they don't have to go through the trouble of like distressing it themselves too. And that just goes back to like being in community and like converse, like it's not easy, I guess, but, um, there are ways to reuse it that way, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we have, and I'm sure us other costume places like the one upstate, we have a whole distress section. So it, it makes it easy if you're doing, um, you know, a, a, a poor scene in the 1930s and the depression, it's always good to have that. We don't need everything that's perfect. So I'm sure that other costume places will accept that as well. Yeah, we, we accept uh, distressed things, um, but uh, going off of what Helen says, you know, maybe don't create a new distressed thing from the beginning if you can avoid it. Uh, rent something that's already distressed. Uh, distress in a way that can be undone depending on what the distressing is. Like try to be conscious about how you are permanently changing the garment uh, and, and think about that reuse from the beginning so you're not getting to the end going, oh, I have all of these blood soaked things. I guess they're garbage. Those are great answers. I, I had a question on that. Sorry, it's Jennifer here. Um, and my camera doesn't seem to be working right now, but just on what you guys were saying um, on that, what is like, uh, you know, do you ever in your decision making for these types of things, like buying distressed or, or, or you know, do, doing the distressing yourself, what, what are the kind of cost um, implications of choosing either one of those? I think it's typically cheaper to get something already distressed because labor is sort of the most expensive part of things. Um, I don't I don't know for sure. And it sort certainly depends in many cases on the, the length of how long you need it for, the length of the rental and if you need to do anything to it. So um, as with anything, it's very complicated and very unique to every situation. Hmm. Uh Okay, we have another question. Uh, are there suggestions, and this is from Alice Tiffany, she's uh, our, one of our own at Earth Angel, um, suggestions for alternatives to plastic shoe and garment bags, um, and if prefer, uh, preferably clear. Yeah, there is a company that you can actually um, call or email and contact them for samples because they also are trying to partner up with like costume departments and with film called Simply STEM and they have compostable garment bags um, and shoe bags but I would say also as far as like I mean not like the best but like for boot bags also like sometimes onion bags so you can like reuse they're like more reusable than plastic clear bags um, depending on what you have and as well like if it's just like garment bags using at least like the vinyl but like zip bags that you can like continue to reuse they're just like more sturdy and also you can store your garments there for wrap so yeah that's those are my uh, yeah that's it great thank you uh, any other options for alternatives okay um, Jen, did we have any other questions um, that were posted in the chat? No, we just had a couple of comments. Um, I don't know if everyone can see them, but um, we had a comment from Jean, Jean Schrenk. Um, 
who said that um, they have had fairly good success washing in an agitator less top loading washing machine on a hand wash cycle with some stuff that I used to send to dry cleaners. So that seems like another, um, you know, more friendly option than and then going to the cleaners and probably a little bit less. <laughs> Um, and also Aaron from Fab Scrap has also included their um, website in there. So please check that out. And um, and uh, sounds like they have a bunch of uh, textile waste uh, fabrics that uh, people can source. On the uh, using the washing machine for hand wash things, um, this applies to contemporary clothing, but there's a lot of contemporary clothing that will say dry clean only on it. Uh, because the manufacturer does not want to give more detailed washing instructions because if you ruin it because you choose to wash it a different way, then they can't be blamed or then the dry cleaner can be blamed. Like so much in your closet is probably labeled dry clean only that will be fine on a gentle cycle. Like um, I've seen so many like knit polyester tops that for some unknown reason is dry clean only. It will be fine. I've been experimenting on my own what the boundaries are of this dry cleaning caveat. Um, and everything's turned out fine in my regular washer. Yep. I, I, I would advocate for an air dry. Don't don't throw it in a in a yes. dryer. <laughs> yeah. Yes, definitely. Um yeah, and then we just had another question about um, can you um, say the name of the garment bag and shoe bag the plastic bags that you were talking about? Yeah, I'll put them in the chat. Simply STEM, S-T-M-E-M, S-T-E-M, STEM. Yeah, really great chat, really great comments in here. So many resources that were shared by everybody, amazing. Um, simply STEM, perfect. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, please, please put them in the chat. Um, these are the experts. Um, okay, we have one more question. How do you all feel about digital receipts over paper receipts as a way of being more sustainable? I can talk about it, I guess. Um, I actually haven't really used um, digital receipts that much, but in cause just because in my brain as a, a coordinator on like lots of projects um the physical paper does just make more sense to me it's easier to just like hand a pa the receipt in the envelope to go do returns i feel like so like you know budget wise there's going to be a lot of room for error um digitally and i would love to see yeah anyone else's like suggestions on programs that could do that like streamlined and stuff but um I, I guess I don't have a lot of experience with it, but um, I think physically for me, it makes more sense in my brain, but um, I hope to see, you know, that expanding in the future, I guess. Um, uh, so I generally prefer a digital receipt actually, uh, unlike, unlike Jennifer. Um, and uh, so paper receipt is not actually paper, it's actually plastic. Uh, it is a heat receptive, plastic paper looking material. Um, so it's not recyclable. So don't put your receipts in the recycling because they are not actually paper. Um, so for that reason, I prefer digital, uh, but there is also sort of the balance of a digital items, this digital artifact still does have a very real world footprint. If it exists on the cloud, it actually exists on a server somewhere. Um, so it does have a physical impact. So there is, again, there's always like, a balance and a trade-off. Uh, but yeah, I do prefer digital. I organize my life much better digitally. I am uh, occasionally irresponsible with receipts and <laughs> I tuck them places and I go, oh, I'll put that in the file later. And then I don't. Um, so for that reason, I prefer digital because I can I can always find it. Yeah, we, we also, uh, we give out a, a lot of tax deduction receipts and uh, they are only digital. And uh, unfortunately we get some of the older population complain that there's no printer and there's they, they don't know how to fill it out they can't find it but you don't even need to print it you, you just forward it right to your accountant and uh i think it's just less waste for everybody for us in our in our category 
It also depends if you like how your productions do accounting, because sometimes you do you end up doing both. Like you end up getting like all the paper receipts, and then you have to upload everything to like sync on set or like cache or like one of these like digit. So you have to take pictures of the receipt anyway to like put it up there, and it's like. Or you get the digital receipt and then you have to print it. Exactly. Or the opposite way around. So like somehow it ends up being like you're doing both both things. So yeah, streamlining that process would be fantastic. I like accountants help us because I think it's also it's not that's not just a costume department situation. That's like a more entangled <laughs> involves a lot of other people. I, I think it's hard for costume departments. We email all our receipts, but when we get items back, they don't send everything back at the same time. So they print on paper and then circle the items they're sending back. And sometimes they print it multiple times because they're, they're, they're sending back other items from that same sheet. So it's a lot of waste of paper, unfortunately, but I can't think of an easier way for them to do it. I mean, we keep the paper and then we slice it and we turn it over and we use it as a scratch pad. I mean, it's the most that we can do, but it, it would be hard, I think, for productions to work only with digital receipts. Hmm. Uh, thank you for all your inputs. We have another question that has come through. Um, have the designers in this panel ever included carbon footprints in their costume designer contracts as a way to offset the pollution um, that the fashion and movie industry creates? Um, and also, do they know of any designers that have done it? Um, I know it's not the perfect solution to the problem, but do they find it's worth it as a way to help offset our damage to the environment? And this is also from Begonia Burgess. Thank you for your question. Uh, Kristen, do you want to? It's just, it's really, really hard to measure. I've never included it in a contract before, but um, so my, my headshot that, that we used uh, was from a puppet project that I did a number of years ago that um, I tried to do carbon offset for the performance. And it was just like such a tiny little sliver that like it was barely even measurable. Um, so yeah, measuring your individual impact is, is really, really tricky. And I've never included it in a contract for that reason. Has anyone else? I have not either, but I do know um, that I believe it was like the, one of the Spider-Man, one of the later Spider-Man movies actually like won quite a few awards for sustainability and like their carbon calculations and like environmental profit and loss. They did a lot of case studies on that one. So one of the things is like actually having somebody be um, like a sustainability PA or a sustainability coordinator for the production. Um, if you can also get one for the costume department and you can like budget for that, amazing. Um, because I think it needs to be um, in tandem with like a professional uh, corporation or company who does that work, like Caring, for instance, who does like environmental profit and loss calculations. Or uh, there might be somebody here, like uh, also the Ontario Green Screen does uh, like carbon calculator. Um, or like Albert. So it depends. I mean, I don't, I don't actually don't know what it is in New York, but I feel like there's, there must be a service there for that does carbon, carbon calculation uh, for productions. Yeah. And I think calculating it on the production level is probably going to be a lot easier than part, part, uh, measuring it on a, an individual design level, just because it is, it's a bigger impact. There's more numbers to start adding together. Um, and as a reminder, the Green Production Guide does offer the PEAR tool, uh, the Production Environmental Accounting Report. Uh, and it's offered, anybody can access that um, through the Green Production website. Um, and it's offered free of charge. And you can plug in um, some of the biggest impact areas of your production. It doesn't include materials for like costuming, um, but uh, fuel use, energy use, transportation, um, those are those can all be measured and it gives like a rough estimate of your carbon footprint. Um, but I think it, it all comes down to like any little action, it still counts, right? Um, you know, just starting somewhere and then getting the ball rolling uh, to, to minimize your impact uh, is, is super important. 
Well, one thing that I do, one thing that I do, because, um, you know, carbon footprint is sort of a, is a, is a tricky tool for measurement, especially for us, um, is I do something called uh, my conscious budget where I do uh, like case studies of individual productions. And I just sort of do like a, a quick one-to-one -one ratio of conscious sources. So anything where I tried to be just a little bit more sustainable, anything secondhand, anything rented, anything from a small business, et cetera, versus conventional sources. And just like, look at that as a percentage of like how well I did during a production, because then I can sort of measure for myself, the, the ethical footprint, the sustainable footprint, et cetera. Because again, applying carbon to clothing, it can be really, really tricky. So I'm going to just put in the chat um, the link to the blog that uh, has a few of those examples there. Yeah, for sure. And there's also a lot of indirect uh, emissions with clothing, right? Like all the downstream, where, how it was produced, every single separate material. Um, so yes, it can be quite challenging to measure um, the, the carbon footprint of costumes. Um, but and I found be. it discouraging. Like, honestly, when I started thinking like, oh, this is something I want to measure, it was just so hard to do that I felt really discouraged, which is why mm -hmm. I kind of like made my own measurement tool that like actually I feel like reflects my choices in a, in a more tangible way for me. <laughs> I think also a fun one, it's not related to like, I think it is related. Like if you do your individual closet and you like understand what's happening at like the level of your closet and then you like go to work and look at like how much you're buying there and like what kinds of things you're buying, especially if you're a designer or a buyer or somebody who like influences the looks and like the fabrics and the chemicals and whatever that are used on a show. Um, yeah, doing, I think, just understanding like your own carbon footprint or like your own environmental profit and loss. You can do those um, at an individual level, like Thread Up, which is like a secondhand online shop has a really easy and fun one. And then they'll give you like some, like this amount, um, of clothing or like your your habits like equal these amount of flights around the world or like I don't know so it's like a way to like conceptualize since we're such visual people you know what that actually means in real world terms and not just a lot of numbers for sure um and I mean I think that's also where it's important to look at the life cycle analysis of every single piece of clothing that you buy are you buying it from somewhere overseas, are you buying it from where, you know, to bring it over to you is, has a higher carbon um, output than buying it from your local vendor? Uh, is it made from a polyester? Is it made from a cotton? Uh, that all contributes to the overall carbon footprint as well. Uh, we have some comments. Oh, they were just, okay, great. There were comments more into the chat, more resources, um, great. Uh, and that, I guess, if there's no other questions, uh, I guess that concludes the question and answer period with the panelists. Uh, thank you so much for all of your valuable insights, all of your um, experience uh, in this, in this, with this topic. Um, all it very appreciated. Thank you so much to everyone else that also came in to to listen into these panelists. Uh, your all welcome to stick around for um, our office hours um, portion of this of this uh, office hours event, um, where anybody can just open up and ask any kinds of questions pertaining to sustainable production. Um, we have many Earth Angel staff on hand as well to offer answers to any of your questions. It doesn't necessarily have to pertain to um, the costume department. Uh, please feel free to plug those into the chat as well, um, and we can answer. Um, or if you come up with another question for the panelists, um, please, please answer or please enter those into the chat. Um, but yes, thank you so much, panelists. Uh, do either of you have anything that you'd like to share? Any final, any final lasting comments on how to be a more sustainable costume department? Yeah, like Kristen said, just do one little thing. It's like overwhelming to think of the impact that we have like negatively and to just be like, well, it's just too overwhelming. Like I would just won't, I don't know where to start. So I'm not going to do anything. Like just do one thing. Like even, I don't know, 
like bring your own coffee cup bring your own bags like little things and then like just to slowly start doing all the other um bigger bigger projects well, and it starts catching on, you know, you mentioned the coffee mug, for example, and I know when I was in grad school, like I was the only person my first year who brought my coffee, my own coffee mug to the coffee shop when we would take coffee breaks. And by my third year, everyone was bringing them. And so you don't necessarily know how quickly those ripples will go out, but they will happen. Perfect. Uh, yeah, those are great points. Just start somewhere, start little and then it just becomes a habit. Yeah, I would say that uh, before you throw it out, think of a way to recycle it or reuse it. Yeah, the importance of buying items that can be disassembled and reused as well. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect. Do we have any, um, any chat, any questions from anybody? participating, anything general, sustainable production comments, questions? Well, you know what, I, I can just say that I had a client last week and she told me she had worked on a Broadway show. And when the show closed, they said, just get rid of the clothes. And she just couldn't do it. So she took them all to her house upstate and then later found out that they were um, revitalizing this show somewhere else. So she rented the entire production. There's really no place in New York that can house these things. And that's that's really a shame. I'm not talking about necessarily, we will house the vintage things, but there, there are no places to house, you know, the, the costumes in themselves or to, I don't know where you can donate them unless you, you know, you know, donate them to, um, to TDF. But other than that, I don't know where to go. You know, they could be sent to Kristen but it would be nice if they were continually recycled and there was some kind of a, um, a listing of places where, where items from shows could go if the producers had no idea where to send them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, maybe that'll be in the works soon enough. Maybe we'll have a, a resource for that. Um, so we're, there are, don't seem to be any other questions. Um, so I really just want to thank the panelists. Thank you so much for participating, for contributing, contributing your time, uh, for giving your insights. Um, and thank you so much to MOM and to the NYC Film Green Program for hosting this workshop um, and spreading information on how we can all just be better for the environment, um, specifically in terms of the film and TV uh, industry. Uh, our next workshop, uh, oh yes, and these are some tips and resources that are on the page, um, some tips from the Green Production Guides uh, Peach, um, this uh, on, in terms of sustainability in particular, but then some, some resources in the New York City area uh, in terms of textile donations uh, and how, where to rent. Here's um, Ellen Ufter's vintage store. Um, but then also guides on how to be more uh, sustainable as well. Um, as a reminder, this session has been recorded um, and it'll be posted to the NYC Film Green webpage. Um, so you can watch it as many times as you'd like. Um, and also our next off office hours um, will be on January 31st and it'll be on sustainability on screen. Uh, it'll be about normalizing sustainable choices and actions for our audiences. Um, we'll talk about green storytelling and we'll talk about you know, pro green product placements on screen as well. Uh, so please stay tuned for that event and feel free to join us. Uh, I'm sure it'll also be incredibly insightful. Um, take a screenshot of the screen as well for these tips that you can um, introduce into your own uh, clothing uh, choices or even uh, how to wash it properly. Um, but again, thank you so much. And uh, I guess that concludes our office hours and have a lovely, lovely evening and rest of the week. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing this. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm. And thank you again to all the participants as well.
It's our pleasure.